Welcome to our latest podcast on COVID-19 and biosurveillance. Um, in this podcast, I'm going to explore with some of the best experts I could wish to the question of whether the pandemic is putting the panopticon under the skin. Uh, we're going to explore this new dawn of health surveillance. And I'm joined by Dr. Stephanie Hare, who is a researcher and a broadcaster working across technology, politics and history. You may have seen her on the BBC or elsewhere, uh, where she regularly appears as an expert on all things tech. And previously, she worked for some big data firms, including Accenture and Palantir. So um, has a really unique and interesting perspective on these issues, especially now as a vocal critic of facial recognition and some of the excesses of surveillance tech. Um, I'm also delighted to be joined by Evan Selinger, who's a professor of philosophy at Rochester Institute of Technology and another uh, big critic of facial recognition. Uh, his research focuses on tech ethics, including AI and privacy. He regularly writes, you may have read him in newspapers such as New York Times, Wall Street Journal and The Guardian. He's also been doing more work with NGOs recently and provided a written testimony for the American Civil Liberties Union um, on the case for a ban of facial recognition. And recently co-authored Re-Engineering Humanity, which explains how the goal of designing, and I'm quoting here, uh, smart programmable worlds goes hand in hand with engineering predictable and programmable people. And I, and now desperate to read that book. Um, that sounds, at the one hand, I already want to tear my hair out um, <laughs> because this is so dark, but so true and so important. So um, yeah, definitely worth a read. So um, some of us uh, have been talking, writing, thinking um, separately and now together about the new type of surveillance that we're seeing in uh, the age of coronavirus and looking at health entering the surveillance sphere. And typically I think a lot of the issues that each of us has been looking at is all centered around security mainly. And health presents a different kind of security question. Personal data is now being seen in many arenas as the answer, um, as providing some kind of mystical essence of, of, of insight to researchers um, and also to the new forms of social control that we're seeing um, as part of public health efforts. We were already, and I think because we've all worked quite a lot on facial recognition, we've already been looking a lot at the biometric and now we're seeing more and more health metrics. And I think this is a really good time to take stock of that and um, Ex examine what is happening and where this is going. So, um, Eva, maybe if we can start with you, what developments are you seeing in this area? What types of biosurveillance or health surveillance have you started to see? Let me try to put this in context real quick, because I, I think in the US, and that's what I've been paying the most attention to, we've had, just to put it mildly, a very serious leadership failure, right? So cases are surging in, in parts of the country at, at an alarming rate. And I think early on, and this is this has played out in a way that sadly, I, I, even I wouldn't have predicted being very cynical. I think early on, there was a concern amongst people like myself that there would be a number of exposure notification apps that would be rolled out real fast uh, they were being called contact tracing apps earlier, and I think that elision between what contact tracing as a form of public health does versus what an exposure notification app provides was sort of being alighted for a while. And I think instead what we've seen is just sadly um, a massive amount of magical thinking, uh, a massive amount of uh, public health being politicized. Um, a massive amount of people who feel that their freedoms run so deeply that uh, the, the higher level collective freedoms sort of don't exist at all. And so in a weird way, um, I don't think at all that we've either seen a major uptick in, in the amount of uh, users, right? I, I don't know of any app at scale <laughs> that's been adopted. So my initial concern was going to be, this was going to be blanketed 
and people were going to be using these things left and right, and there's so many problems with them. I think that now that we're at a certain phase where things are reopening and certain politicians, because we we have no federal response, things have been defaulting locally. I do think now there's a lack of transparency and everything is going to be thrown out yet again, I think is universities are going to be reopening despite all of the cautions that they shouldn't. I think it's entirely unclear sort of like what apps are going to be thrown out there. So I, I guess what I'm saying is my initial concern was that we were going to be finding private tech companies being integrated into the public health response in a major way. And we would quickly be watching a major chain of data absorption. And I think we've just seen systemic failures of all of this in ways that I, I, I have no idea what's coming down the pike, to be honest with you. I think it's still a kind of like, let's throw everything at this in the kitchen sink in a highly scrambled, very decentralized way that's hard to keep track of where all this is going. That's really interesting because in the UK, we have had a bit more of that integration between big tech and, and public health. We've got um, Palantir in the NHS, Amazon, Google, uh, big data stores being created, faculty, the AI uh, startup. We had drone surveillance in the first few weeks. Uh, we've got thermal scans, but we've had a similar experience with contact tracing. Um, and just to make clear, by the way, um, so you're in the US, Steph is in the UK uh, with me, not sadly in the same place, <laughs> but <laughs> both in London. Um, the contact tracing has been a disaster, hasn't it, Steph? Um, yeah, the British word omni shambles, I feel has been really useful here. Um, and what's really interesting is that we're just next door to Ireland, which has had a really di different journey with its app. Um, and I'm really grateful to Evan for pointing out that difference between a contact tracing app and an exposure notification app, because I think that was part of the problem here in the UK is people almost thought the app was going to do things that it wasn't going to do. Um, and that was because of the whole debate over what kind of model we were going to use. And for anyone who hasn't been paying attention, and I wish I were you, uh, we had a sort of three month migraine over which model we were going to use and if we were going to use the Google Apple API or not. And after 12 million pounds, um, the government decided that it it was not going to do its own bespoke solution. It was in fact going to potentially, I think last time I checked, um, go for the Google API model or app and, and start, sorry, API and build its own app but that that won't be available until winter. However, this government has said so many things about this app so many times that it would also not surprise me if they were just punting that into the long grass and it was just hoping it will quietly go away and we'll all forget about it. But I haven't, I've got it diarized for winter, uh, which being American, I kind of cite around Thanksgiving time. So end of November. Uh, I will definitely be keeping an eye on that because I want to know if they're going to use it. And I think their view on it is they feel that lots of other countries have managed to put out an app, but that it hasn't been a game changer anywhere, whether that's because there hasn't been sufficient uptake of people downloading the app, or if it's because the Bluetooth actually isn't very precise yet in helping to deal with things like, have you actually been exposed to someone with it? You know, it's it's got to be within such a small distance and it has to be for the right length of time. And then to be honest, as we're learning more about the pathology of this virus, all of this starts to kind of feel a bit um, irrelevant because we're learning about how you can catch this from it being transmitted in the air now, you know, so that everyone actually should just be wearing masks. And maybe, maybe a mask is a far better return on investment, frankly, um, than these apps. Can the app capture if something is being transmitted in the air and going you know, going downwind or circulating in a closed space versus an outdoor space. So if I pass you outside in a park, am I actually being exposed to you versus if I pass you sitting in class or in the office or in the grocery store standing in a queue getting ready to pay? Like the risk threat, it's almost like with cybersecurity, the threat vector is different um, for the same virus. And we also don't even know, you know, about viral loads. We know here in the UK, there's a lot of really interesting research coming out about shopkeepers, right, who are being exposed loads um, because so many people are coming in and they're stuck in, a, in an enclosed space. Um, ditto people who are driving buses. So 
just because you pass someone or not on the street or, or are in contact with them for 15 minutes or more is not necessarily the way to catch the virus. We're, st we're still learning about it yet, I guess is my point, mm -hmm. um, in ways that are evolving all the time. And that could make this conversation redundant in three months or even you know, a month um, with our brilliant scientists. So I think that's part of the problem is that everybody invested in the apps because I think you kind of had to, we didn't know anything back in March and it was kind of like, just throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. And I, I have some sympathy with that. Um, that said, we'll have a really good indicator. I think probably by the end of this year, we'll have enough countries that have done enough models with enough rates of uptake to be able to kind of make an early call on whether or not apps are part of the solution or not so much for this particular virus. So I still think it's good lessons learned. The concern is, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Can I just respond to something Stephanie said? Because it's, it, it's so spot on. And I think there's also another point to it that I just want to tease out. Um, yeah, masks don't collect data. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a great form of analog PPE. To be sure, towards the beginning of the pandemic, there were certainly mixed messages being sent. I, I, I think if we step outside mm -hmm. politicized public health, those messages have fallen away and it's very clear how important they are. There might have been supply chain issues with these. I think we've done better with them. But I wanted to sort of just tease out one really big point, right? Because this, this is what we've seen with so much of the digital response. There's been a longstanding trend in technology to hope for some kind of a techno solution or a techno fix. And in a weird way, I think, <laughs> I think face masks might have a better chance of doing that than any of these digital solutions. Because I think some of the hope with the exposure notification app, which I, I really think was just doomed from the start, forget the fact that there's gonna be all kinds of efficacy issues, right? It doesn't matter whether you're going with Bluetooth or GPS, there's gonna to be tons and tons of efficacy issues. Then you're gonna have problems of like penetration issues, right? Like how many phones are gonna be able to use whatever you're doing? So then you're gonna be concerned about with disparate impacts, right? So if you're dealing with certain populations having it worse than others, are these gonna be the populations that are included? And if they're not included, if you have to find a way for them to be included, was that providing an opportunity for corporations to create highly subsidized if not seemingly free public health tools that are really just a kind of backdoor to sort of future surveillance capitalist problems. I mean, I think these things were sort of very obvious, but there were other things that would prevent this from being any kind of a techno fix, I think from the very, very beginning, which also was besides having issues of, well, are we gonna use a decentralized model or a centralized model? And that was bringing up issues of who do we trust less, governments or tech companies very quickly, the conversation, and, and to some degree, I'm very sympathetic to Apple and Google for saying, look, if we didn't prioritize privacy or try to prioritize it as best as possible, like we, we would be heavily criticized and there would be no way this would stand any chance. But of course, with distrust of both governments and corporations being so high, the obvious next criticism came out, which is, whoa, 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 by creating a standard by creating a standard here that's going to make it decentralized, you have more control over public health, people have been arguing, than any tech company or um, collaboration between tech companies should have. So one could also ask from the very beginning, rather than seeing this as a techno fix, which I think a lot of zeal behind it was, what if we had a very different model, right? What if these companies said from the start, what is it that the contact tracers need? Like the people who do this as a form of public health, how can we provide back end support? What can we do to get more people trained and have those who are involved in this reach people easier and better? But that just wasn't the model to begin with. So I think there's been a, a constellation of forces, which is this longstanding idea that there is some sort of techno fix. I think the digital version of that seems much sexier than an analog mask. And so that was picking up. And then on top of that, I, I think that, you know, I don't want to be overly cynical, but if Apple and Google could have been more successful, I think that would have been a public relations boon. And every time people saw their app, it would perhaps make them feel like, you know, thankfully when the state has sort of failed us, at least these tech companies, if they would have worked in the background by helping contact tracers, it wouldn't have been as glamorous, but I think it could have been more effective. So this theme of tech solutionism that has um, 
actually just wreaked havoc, I think, on, on public life for the for the past few years with some of the surveillance developments that we've seen. Um, uh, my concern is that there's a free for all now with these um, kinds of unproven experimental um, surveillance applications um, all, all over the place. Um, and even if you take something analog like face masks, there is now a market for CCTV that can automate the identification of face masks, making sure everyone in a vicinity is wearing a face mask. Or again, a, a solution, <laughs> I'm using the phraseology now, the solution of physical distancing, but the fact that we are encouraged to uh, physically distance, that can also be picked up in an automated way by surveillance cameras. And we've, we've started to find these things coming into workplaces um, and other environments. There's one thing in particular that I think is a really interesting example of this, of, of this kind of surveillance theater, which is the thermal scanners. Um, and uh, these are now being used in a number of airports in the UK and a port as well. Um, Heathrow is, I think was the first um, and is doing all kinds of other automated profiling with it. Schools, um, I found a cinema recently was using it, my local gym, RIP. Um, Apple, the Apple store, I had to have, um, I had to have a thermal scan just going into the Apple store. So this, this is, is all over the place. Um, I will just explain to, to listeners in, in, in case um, they're not aware of what thermal scanners do, because there's been a very successful marketing drive recently that, that these are now fever detectors which is not the case. They detect radiated infrared energy from surface areas, um, which can indicate temperature, but not core body temperature, which is taken, for example, with a the thermometer under the tongue. Um, so these kind of experimental temperature readings are now being used as a gateway to a whole host of rights, uh, whether it's travel, education, et cetera, freedom of movement. Um, I'm wondering, Evan, have you seen these as well? Is this taking off in the US as well? For, for sure. So, I mean, when you talked about airports, I still don't know. So Brenda Leung and I wrote a piece about this like a month ago, and that's when Heathrow had announced that it was going to start doing some experiments. And I have no idea. You guys could tell me in the UK, like, what that's amounted to and, like, what happens if people get pulled aside and what the procedures are for denying people opportunities. So I'm really interested to hear what you know. In the US, it's been, I think it's been very interesting. And as with everything, it's not uniform and it's a mixed bag. So I think in some cases, you do honestly, truly find people saying, look, um, we are going to rearrange our offices or we're gonna rearrange our workplaces to maximize for social distancing. And we're gonna have mask policies and, 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 and thermal screening too, right? So this becomes yet another tool. Now it's possible, it's possible that if there is a sufficiently integrated system where for example, given the, since these weren't designed to be fever detectors at all, and it's so easy to get a wrong read, if you have an opportunity, for example, to give analog like regular temperature screens as a backup if this goes wrong and you have other protocols in place, I could see this having marginal impact like marginal extra value. The problem becomes when you have places that don't do the rest of this and are just looking to create easy markers of confidence to make people feel like we're doing something, right? And so you have, I think it's something like at least 25% of people who are asymptomatic that are COVID positive. So if that's the case, even if this were medically accurate, you wouldn't be detecting that, like besides the fact that these weren't made to, to detect that. But then there's other issues, right? And this is where it becomes a holistic policy problem. And again, we're back in the techno solutionism. If you're creating workplaces that use temperature screening as like a prerequisite for getting in and you don't offer people like sufficient resources to be able to stay home if in fact they're sick, you're kind of creating an incentive market for people to cheat the system, right? Like you're, you're basically asking people to take, you know, um, aspirin or something like that to be able to uh, bring the symptoms down in order to pass these checks. So part of the difficulties here, I really think, are how are these things being integrated? Are they part of larger systems? And also, what are the resources available if people are going to be denied opportunities? I think there was an easy hope that these would be plug and play 
And on top of that hope, every person, you know, not every person, but companies who are manufacturing these, this is the thing about digital scalability. These are always the Trojan horses that become the entry point for further surveillance. So if you have one of these systems, then the question becomes, how inexpensive is it to upgrade additional features, put in a facial recognition feature or some sort of facial characterization feature? And that's easy to lose sight of. So when people see these as simply, we're investing in public health without recognizing how stackable these things are for other kinds of surveillance, you really don't understand the, the logic and the kind of economic imperatives of expanding infrastructure this way. It's interesting you say that because Heathrow is, is a fantastic example of that. They say, um, and you were asking about how this works in practice, they say that it's just a trial phase. They said that they were gonna escalate to uh, a point where if someone was flagged, then they would be redirected to health professionals. But um, we actually wrote from, from Big Brother Watch, we, we wrote a, a long letter to them about why we just thought this was a terrible idea and basically needed to stop. And some of that's been backtracked on. So there's now no talk of escalation to health professionals. It's purely a live experiment using passengers as guinea pigs. Um, and passing off all that data but they have already escalated as you said to automated profiling so they're now using thermal scanners to also guess age gender uh, style of movement whether people are wearing masks whether people are wearing anything on their head even whether they're carrying a cup of tea <laughs> um it's very british observation for a machine to make obviously um steph what what, what do you make of thermal scanners I guess I would want to know if it's being matched with somebody's other data, right? So again, and this is before I sort of um, parse for privacy and data protection and civil liberties and human rights violations, the technologist in me is just curious to be like, does this actually even solve any problems? Like, does it work before we kind of care about if it's a good thing? I just want to know if this even work. Um, because then I can maybe move on to solve the second part. But the, the purely functional question I would have is like, okay, you, you scan somebody's temperature, as you said, like, I would like to talk to doctors about this and be like, how do you know, how do you feel about this? Because if you need a, a core temperature reading, you know, normally I have to put a thermometer under my tongue or under my armpit, or the best that you would do in a hospital or doctor setting might be rectum, right? And that's like 15 seconds usually maybe 30 seconds to get an accurate reading. And this matters because if you get somebody's temperature and use that temperature to make a decision that affects their ability to act. So can you get on that flight or not? Can you enter the country freely or do you have to go and get a test and go into quarantine potentially for a certain amount of time? Are you allowed to come into your office or not? Into the shop or not? Accuracy matters. So if thermal scanning doesn't give an accurate reading, you know, I want to know, like, what's the decision threshold? Is it like, I'm using Fahrenheit, I'm so sorry, uh, coming from the states of my childbirth, my, in my childhood, my, my numbers are still in Fahrenheit. But I would be like, okay, if my normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, first of all, not everybody's is. There's a lot of um, data showing that people's body temperatures have lowered on average in a generation, which is fascinating. For women, it could depend on their cycle or if they're menopausal or not. So just, you know, what's going on with that? Is there a range for that? We famously know there's tons of research on it that um, there's, you know, gender bias in data. So are these systems and decision-making processes around something is seemingly objective as body temperature, taking into effect, uh, taking into account the fact that actually lots of people's body temperature is a lot of variation. Um, so I guess I just want to know all of that first. And I want to know what doctors are saying about that. Then Evan raised the great point that not everybody with coronavirus will ever have a temperature. So even people who show symptoms might be showing other symptoms than a fever. But then you've got people who are pre-symptomatic. They just haven't shown their symptoms yet, but they will, but they're infectious. So you're not going to catch them. And then there's asymptomatic people who will never show symptoms, but have the virus and could be passing it on. So we're still learning about this, but we at least know that, that fever is not always the best indicator of coronavirus. Conversely, lots of people have fever, could have fever for reasons other than coronavirus. So there's that. They might be on medications. Maybe they don't want to be talking about treatments that they're having. So their privacy could be being violated if they have to explain why they have a fever. Um, it would just be, you know, it's really complicated. Like it sounds so simple, like, oh yeah, just scan somebody. Um, 
medically, I think it sounds quite dodgy. So again, I agree with the fact that it's like, it can be seen to be doing something. And it, it's sort of like this obsession with trying to get people back into indoor dining or theater or concert halls. And in the United States, I was um, seeing people were saying, look, we clean this really regularly where, you know, we do antivirals lockdown, we clean the whole thing. It's like, yeah, but if it's transmitted by aerosol, that kind of isn't the biggest transmission vector. Like it's gonna be all of us in here breathing together. So you can clean this theater as much as you want, but you pack it full of 500 people all breathing, you're gonna have a spreading event. So it's kind of like that. It's like you can thermal scan people or even take their body core temperatures. Um, that may not be, you might not be solving the right problem there. And you would therefore create a number of other problems. And I loved Evan's point as well about perverse incentives from this. So it doesn't really matter if you can go into a shop or not, I guess. You can get a lot of stuff delivered. But if you have to go to work, if your employer doesn't make it, so it's easy for you to stay at home at work or that you get paid. You know, not everybody can like work from home with a laptop. Some people are manual workers or run their own business. So what are they supposed to do, right? Um, if that's not covered either by the state or by their employer, they're going to have to do what it takes to lower their body temperature. If, that, if that's the, the sort of barrier to entry for them to earn. And, and just to riff one other thing with perverse incentives, and I don't know how this is going to play out, but there's huge questions here, at least in the States, about what liability is going to be for employers in terms of like what happens when people get sick. So I do wonder if there's going to become a kind of like checklist phenomenon where there are going to be regimes created that are like, well, depending on your due diligence, your liability will be varied. And I'm wondering if being able to say things like, well, we're including thermal scanning is going to be a way, regardless of the efficacy and the other problems that Stephanie's been pointing out too, whether this is going to be a way of saying, well, well look, you know, we, we've done all that could reasonably be expected. Yeah, it definitely seems to be, and I'm saying this not only because I'm generally cynical about surveillance, but because there is really such a limited evidence base uh, underneath thermal scanning in particular, but some of the other forms of surveillance that we've seen. And so just to throw this in, some of the relevant research that I found when trying to look into, trying to understand why this is now popping up everywhere. Uh, during a seasonal flu epidemic, a New Zealand study found airport thermal scanners were, quote, not much better than chance at identifying infected travelers. Uh, during the SARS epidemic, 763,082 passengers were screened by thermal scanners in Toronto and Vancouver airports, but failed to identify a single case. A lot of the expert bodies are advising against it. The World Health Organization has, and the Center for the Mathematical Modeling of Infectious Diseases, which has been doing a lot of leading research on coronavirus, um, said that they found exit or entry screening at airports for initial symptoms via thermal scanners or similar is unlikely to prevent passage of infected travelers into new countries or regions. The European Center for Disease Prevention and Control also cautioned against thermal screening in airports, warning that the measure is not supported by scientific evidence. And, and so I'm pu pu pulling my hair out thinking, why then? Um, why, we, why do we now have this as a, as a gateway to some really fundamental rights? Like you say, the, the ability to earn, and I completely, um, yeah, there's a question about then making sure that um, there's a security blanket when people should be at home and, and are unwell, but, um, why is this gateway there in the first place? Some people have said, um, like, does it matter? So yeah, of, of course, there's a there's a, a question about um, whether it works or not. But some people kind of say, you know, so if you could get paid to go home from work, does it really matter? How do you read the civil liberties issues on this? If we see an expansion of thermal surveillance? Are, are, are you ask? Are you asking if this is like a primary driver, or just about using like a range of like health screening tools to make determinations about opportunities? I think that's the question. I think the question is why should people care? It, it, because this seems like something that's being put in place, as you say, for two reasons. One is the liability issue, and the other is confidence making people feel like it's fine to be getting on flights, it's fine to be going to the gym, to the cinema, to school. So, 
if I gave one answer to this, because <laughs> being in the university sector, I, I, I would love for you guys to tell me what's happening in, in the UK. But in the US, it seems like, and we're finding more and more people talking about this, there was, you know, just an explosion recently of, of, of you know, people feeling they've got to speak out. Universities, for the most part, basically decided they've got to reopen. And it's a very dodgy proposition, as, as other people have pointed out, right? So we do have some that have said they're going to go online, but the concern was financial, right? So the concern was basically, look, uh, administrators bought into the idea that given the high cost of it, uh, high cost of tuition in both public and private schools in the U.S., that a significant number of students would choose not to go to a school that they would otherwise go to if the education would be online. Okay, so they bought into this idea that students would either take a gap year, which I find kind of hard to believe. Like it's a pandemic, where are you going to go and what are you going to do, or like that they're going to get jobs when you know. The whole economy has been decimated and that there were outcries that, well, if it's going to be online, like it should be reduced tuition. So instead of biting the bullet and saying like back in, I don't know, April, we're going to commit to not opening campuses in the fall. We're going to invest in the best form of online education possible. So the online education that you got in the spring when your courses were disrupted that wasn't real online education. These were classes designed to be taught in person that we were throwing basically band-aids at, you know, gushers of blood, right? People were just doing their best on the spot. We, we can do better. But instead, there was a kind of fetishized version of needing to appear on, per, in, in, uh, on, on campus. And I think the mental model, I think students are gonna be shocked. I think they're gonna think they're getting on campus and it's still going to be, things are going to be very different. You know, courses that might normally meet a few times a week, maybe they're going to meet once a week, plus something online. Will there be sports? Will the cafeterias be open? I, but my point of all this is that thermal screening will probably be very popular there too, right? I don't think universities in the U.S. have enough opportunity to test everybody. Like, that resource hasn't really come into play. And so if you begin with an economic imperative, that things have to happen for economic reasons, then you have to kind of figure out what are the best ways that I can create at least the appearance of safety and conscientiousness once it's a foregone conclusion that economics is gonna drive our decision-making. And so then you're gonna put in something like thermal screening and what are gonna be the, the, the ultimate, you know, say civil liberties implications of this? Well, it really depends also on like, how is all of this going to be used, right? Like universities aren't even necessarily well equipped to be thinking about the civil rights or civil liberties implications of this. So we have, you know, students are already a very highly surveilled population, right? We have massive amounts of data on them and we say this is, you know, for their well-being. So I think this is going to depend sort of context by context, but I wanted to use this as one specific window to say, if you have economics driving this and you're not accustomed to thinking, you're thinking of data as being in the person's best interest, you're not accustomed to having a culture that's raising these, even questions of normalization aren't normally sort of part of this. Like, what, what kinds of values are we indoctrinating? These are externalities that, you know, are just not dealt with in the system. It, it's hard not to see there being like a lot of pain being caused by operationalizing in this way. Mm. Steph, you think a lot about tech ethics and I know you're writing a book at the moment about tech ethics. So I'm sure this is factoring into all of your thinking in a, in a major way. What do you think the ethical and civil liberties issues are with this kind of um, health, surveillance theater? I think I'm in, um, funnily enough, going back to Hippocrates and, and the Hippocratic Oath of, you know, first do no harm. Um, and I feel like a lot of what we're just, we're talking about in terms of the biosurveillance apparatus that we could build, it's a choice, we don't have to do it, um, has a lot of harm to it. And I'm, I also think it's a sign that we failed because a lot of countries have actually managed to get the virus under control. You know, it's not inevitable. I think 
because the US failure, um, and it, it pains me to say that, so I hope it's okay as an American I'm going to say, like, I'm sad. I'm sad that my nephews don't get to go back to uni and that, you know, they're the ones who are in high school, like it's disrupting their education, it's disrupting their childhood. Um, I'm sad for all the people that have died and like the economy that's been destroyed. And this is massive. And that's a failure of our, our country at a political level from the CDC on down. And you know, something's happened there. So it's sometimes hard when you're faced with such failure and you just think, okay, well, the answer is we're just gonna go full on big brother and like, you know, <laughs> microchip the planet. And that's where you manage the, the situation when they're not actually looking at the rest of the world and going, Again, our friends in Ireland, our friends in New Zealand have done a pretty good job actually at you know, crushing it. And that doesn't mean they don't have to stay vigilant, but they are not having to spend the money on a biosurveillance apparatus. They aren't having to traumatize their children in the same way. You know, Denmark is doing fine. Germany is doing pretty well. Like Their kids are going back to school. Yes, the economy is being affected, but it's not this sort of inevitability that this is the only option. So I think Part of me would almost be like, again, I want to, I would want to be seeing this from like the business case, as well as the civil liberties case of like, which one is going to cost us more? Is it going to, is it going to get everybody back in school and working again to build this biosurveillance system? Or actually, is it better for us to invest the limited money that we have in actually crushing the virus properly? <laughs> you know, like, which I've never heard the United States at any level discuss and kind of here in the UK, we have a really tricky and interesting problem, which is that you know, Scotland is doing really well. England is doing terribly. Wales is doing pretty good and Northern Ireland's been doing pretty good. And Northern Ireland's got its app out and so does Gibraltar. This <laughs> is like very awkward that pub for Public Health England, which was so well resourced and funded that they couldn't even get an app together. Whereas like a nation like Northern Ireland can, and guess what? They're using the other model, right? Because it has to be compliant with the Republic of Ireland. So we're seeing lots of examples where it is not inevitable that you have to do this to people. And therefore we don't even have to have these conversations about privacy and civil liberties and human rights. We don't ever have to go down that path. And I think that's what kind of scares me is the economic incentives to build that big brother world of biosurveillance are gonna be really powerful. A lot of companies would stand to make a lot of money from that. And a lot of people in power would too. I wonder how much money they stand to make from crushing the virus personally. I would love to hope that they would take the big picture view that they will make more money if everybody feels confident that we've crushed the virus and life can resume normally. But we saw post 9-11, like there's a whole world of people out there who love surveillance and they will, they will set the terms of the debate as this is inevitable. We can't, we can't have, you know, schools in the United States have to have in some places metal detectors, right? It's like, and you start to normalize an entire generation of children to think that they have to be surveyed in that way. And all of this comes back to, if you don't do this, you'll let the terrorists win. <laughs> it's like, there's people who go to school and never have to deal with that ever. And I just think we have to be really careful with the coronavirus that there are places that have got this under control and don't have to traumatize their people in this way or take their data or make them think that this is the only option. But that requires taking a really comparative, broad, holistic approach and if right. I can add, sorry, just one thing to this, because this is like really, like this just destroys like my everyday life here, right? I, I do wonder about those differences and I wish I had more sort of cross-cultural data, but this always makes me wonder to Stephanie's point that this is not inevitable. You have to begin with that question of what are the drivers? And if there are cultural drivers, again, especially in a country like the United States, if you begin with this idea that there's thoroughgoing individualism as part of the DNA of our culture, and it's not just libertarianism, but under neoliberalism, right? This has been exacerbated. The sense that you are on your own. No one is going to be looking out for you. You are responsible for your health and your family's health. Don't, don't look to a welfare state because there is no welfare state, right? This is the message that's been drummed in over and over and over again. So if you begin with that, and then you also begin with this idea that we're you know, perfectly fine right now with stoking highly polarized, not just politics, but politicizing public health in such a way that we know a significant percentage of the population will never be looking at facts in the same way, right? Even what, you know, a mask is, right? This has now become a symbol of the culture wars. This isn't something that we can merely frame from a public health perspective, right? This has become something that people are protesting, having to 
having to wear. And so given this cultural matrix, this becomes an incentive to believe that, well, of course we need technology because we can't rely on solidarity. We can't rely on common purpose. We can't. And I think in a really interesting and highly tragic way, what we're probably seeing, and again, I don't have data to support, this is very anecdotal, but anecdotally, I've seen that the communities that have been hit the hardest, that have the biggest disparate impacts of this, are the ones that have the highest sense of solidarity and a sense of community purpose because they recognize the vulnerability here. And so I think it's a lot of this cultural baggage incentivizes framing things in a technological way because it's like, let's, get, let's give up on solving collective action problems through other means. So we, we've got to do this because we can't trust people to put aside or find ways to temporarily transcend all of this other all of these other difficulties that I've been talking about. I, I guess another another way of looking at that, I'm not sure if this is a counterpoint or not, but that there has also been heavily impressed on the public the sense of duty in adopting uh, or cons accepting forms of surveillance that are nonsensical or risky. Um, I think thermal surveillance is a good example of that. And when we had the contact tracing app Palava um, in the UK, and it clearly wasn't going to work, and it was being run by GCHQ, and people had very serious reasoned concerns about this basically putting people on state issued tag. And yet we were told it's your duty. And there is this kind of sense at the same time, it says like a collective duty to, to walk into this a new kind of surveillance uh, era and, and a sense of acceptance. I, I just wonder, uh, maybe if we can <laughs> try to come to a, a, a positive conclusion, although that's not necessary because it might not be positive. You have to be honest, I suppose. Um, but how can we get out of this? If we are, I think each of us is talking in, in perhaps like different ways about different ways of thinking and surveillance, health surveillance in particular, taking on a different kind of position in society. This will have long-term effects. I'm sure we're all aware of that. This will, you know, there will not be a switch that we flick off at any point which says now we're going to take away all of this infrastructure. We spoke about the kind of, Evan, you spoke about the kind of ratcheting and the additional features that a lot of these uh, surveillance tools have. Um, in fact, this is a good time for me to read this um, really good quote uh, from Didier Bijo, uh, a professor um, in, in um, political science who said, it's doubtful if a state of normality would even be possible through a surveillance network of tracing applications. Would we really be able to regain our freedom of movement if that movement is under constant surveillance governed by digital applications? As many security professionals currently seek to reimagine our future, will we let them treat us like herds in a pasture by coupling each person's biological identifiers with their digital identification? How do we avoid that risk? I think theoretically we know what the answer is and then the question becomes whether there's any practical means of, of being able to do this right so i mean there's really i think two main models right there's the more just say no model so i, I am hardened like i honestly despite all the work that stephanie's been doing that my colleagues have been doing i i am shocked and this was really i think more catalyzed by the black lives matter protests than by the pandemic there, there is a democratic bill under consideration called the Facial Recognition and Biometric Moratorium Act of 2020, which would literally put the kibosh from a federal perspective on law enforcement having access to certain kinds of technologies and use lack of federal funding as an incentive structure on more local levels. So I, I think we see in this, right, as, as a certain type of model for being able to actually not just say, okay, how do we sort of handle risk rewards? Like in some cases, like it is really, we, we absolutely need to find structures for prohibition. So because we're dealing with multiple pandemics, I think the social justice calls that are coming out of the Black Lives Matter protests might be able to have some positive effects on some of these civil liberty and privacy concerns that previously were more being discussed of in terms of like pandemic measures. So I'm seeing this as like a really good window to bring together more urgency amongst more constituencies than we saw before. 
On a lesser level, and again, I think this is gonna depend on how we're able to enact this. I think we know what the main things that need to be operationalized are, right? Stephanie, like if you were to abstract from the discussions that the three of us have been having, we know the big questions, right? Like, is something even necessary? Is something gonna be effective or not? Is it proportionate to the kinds of responses that we are, are, are dealing with? Is it equitable? So will, will it be able to positively affect enough people Right? Are there enough justice precautions to deal with the externalities? Do we have the right kinds of either data minimization or data anonymization in place? Do we have sunset clauses right, to be able to end this data? Or do people have rights to be able to pull data out of this? Like We have a broad sense, and can these things in a meaningful way actually be enforced as opposed to merely being things that exist you know, sort of theoretically or in documents, but there's no actual enforcement mechanism. This is always the biggest problem that we're facing is that the pandemic with resource scarcity can make a lot of these ideas seem very bold and energizing, but pragmatically when the rubber hits the road, not as much. So, but back to the hopeful thing, I really am looking at this potential overlap between the Black Lives Matter protests and concerns about civil liberties and privacy that were being articulated about pandemic surveillance. And I'm hoping in that Venn diagram of overlapping energy, we might see some positive momentum on both of these fronts. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, that's powerful stuff. Um, I think for my part, I'm looking at this because it's a global problem, like a planetary problem. I'm gonna be really intrigued and I'm tracking in my own research, the response of, I wanna see what countries basically get back to normal as quickly as possible. And I want to track their economic performance as well as their health performance. And also like, can they get their kids back in school? Are they able to form travel corridors with one another? Or are we gonna do what we're kind of seeing this summer which is like everyone I think is just kind of gone, we have to save the economy. So just like, let travel happen and people want to take the risk they can because we've got two crises. We've got a health crisis and an economic crisis happening now and both are set to get worse. So I get why they're doing that, but I could almost imagine where it's going to get to a point where, you know, right now Americans can't leave the United States, right? So like all of a sudden are, are people in the United States going to look around and go other countries have it where their kids are back in school, they're going to work, their economies are doing better they can travel and go on holiday and basically kind of have a normal life. And we're sitting here in some sort of like apocalypse now situation, uh, which is, you know, which is kind of the track the country's on unless they sort their themselves out. I was going to swear, but I caught it. So um, America needs to sort itself out. So I think I'm interested in that. And I'm interested in this concept of resilience because it's like, this has been an incredible global stress test. Like we have realized as a planet, how vulnerable we are because we're so connected now because we travel so much and that the virus doesn't care about politics. Like the virus doesn't care if you want to wear a mask or not, right? It's a virus. So I want to see which countries respond best across several metrics because I want to know who is going to be in a good position for the next one because I think there will be another one. I cannot imagine this is gonna be just another one, you know, once in a sort of hundred year event, unfortunately, given the changes that have occurred in how we live as humans and what we're doing to the, the environment. So if we see who can respond to this quickly and if we learn as a group, and if we learn through our institutions like the WHO and the different health authorities, and if tech is a part of that or not, like what part, all of that, I'm, I guess I'm optimistic now in the sense that I think human beings are really self-interested and we want to stay alive. <laughs> we, we want to thrive even, not just survive. So I think eventually taking the long view, we will put the masks on and wash our hands and sort ourselves out and learn from the data and we'll figure it out because I think everyone is kind of looking at the countries that have already responded well with a little bit of envy and a little bit of shame and embarrassment going, doesn't matter if you're the richest country in the world or if you've got the best tech companies or you know a fantastic NHS like we've got here something has gone wrong and we're going to have to take a long hard look at ourselves and you know eventually stop apportioning blame and just solve the problem and you can't solve it just one country or one government it's going to have to be all of us like again cybersecurity we're only as strong as our weakest link in this so we'll have to work together and help each other so i i think I think self-interest will play. And I think the vision of getting back to a wonderful life again 
will appeal to all of us and really concentrate minds. And, you know, we may get a vaccine that will help us solve this particular problem, but I just hope we don't waste the learnings from this for the next one. Yes, a wonderful future, hopefully one without COVID detecting drones <laughs> and <laughs> thermal scanners in every corner, etc. Um, I've learned a lot by speaking to you both. Thank you so much. I think it might be interesting to come back and see where we are with biosurveillance measures in a few months, um, because we're just, I think we're just at the beginning. Um, and, um, but I'm, I'm taking the slight amount of optimism you have both given as to how we can find a way out with existing standards and uh, self-preservation simply. Um, and uh, yeah, certainly at Brotherwatch, we're gonna keep campaigning on these issues. Um, but thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, yeah.